stress and trauma uh, in psychosis and schizophrenia. Why? Uh, because early life stress is a big deal for every psychiatric disorder, so it stands to reason that it might be relevant to, uh, to, the, to the generation or the impact of psychotic disorders. And so uh, to sort of steal from my conclusions, uh, we don't know the best about what to do specifically when we encounter um, significant trauma histories or comorbid trauma-related diagnoses, but at least during this episode or during this lecture, I want to take a, take a bit of a closer look at the relationship between early life stressors and later life psychotic illness. Um, so I think, I think a lot of folks in the audience uh, are going to be find some of this to be a bit of a review, but uh, but for the sake of completeness, gigantic textbooks and have been written, and libraries could be filled with studies that look at the effects of early life stresses in a variety of animals, and show that no matter what the stressor putting it in the cold, taking it away from the mother, giving it an impoverished environment, uh, whatever the nature of the stressor during early life, um, those uh, early life stressors have far ranging and profound impacts uh, in the entire organism that can be measured almost at any point during its adult life. Uh, what the science believes might be a linchpin that underlies all these numerous um, body-wide changes uh, relates to the ability to the to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, simplistically, uh, steroid hormones or cort uh, cortisol is um, a marker of stress, and uh, the the kidneys, the adrenal glands, release this as a way to um, as, as part of the fight or flight response. Uh, what's thought to happen is that these surges in cortisol. Um, ultimately desensitize the hippocampus, which is supposed to ultimately turn off that signal. Um, and with the, if the hippocampus is, if the hippocampus becomes unable to recognize what normal cortisol, aka what normal stress is like, uh, then it fails to turn off the stress signal and that can set up brain development to go awry. Uh, what is maybe less obvious from the classic line about early life stress is that um, those changes that I described actually have pretty strong um, ability to impact dopamine signaling um, in ways that are actually reminiscent of the dopamine signaling changes that we see in schizophrenia. Uh, specifically, uh, early life stresses uh, and, and, and acute stresses uh, cause the release of dopamine and set the system up to become uh, better able to release dopamine. And again, the majority of what we call schizophrenia is probably you know, accurately thought of as dopamine psychosis. So stimuli in the form of stresses that cause the brain to be um, hyperactive in its dopamine production and signaling um, are indeed a setup for psychotic illness. And, um, and, and of course, all the above can lead to uh, memory changes. So that's, a, that's a finding from the animal literature. So, um, turning, turning from primarily animal studies into human, in human studies, uh, the effect of early life trauma on later life psychosis is a significant one. In some estimations, about uh, a third of schizophrenia risk on a population level is attributed to early life stressors. Um, and if one looks at populations of people with, with um, chronic psychotic illnesses, then the odds ratio or the likelihood that one has experienced an early life traumatic event goes to about three. So a threefold elevation of the odds um, in the trauma exposed versus the non-exposed in the later life development of um, psychosis. In looking at other studies where we look at specifically what are the stressors that can be seen in in groups of people that have um, adolescent or young adulthood onset psychosis. Uh, this is a table of, of those factors. Uh, so between 14% or up to 40% will have experienced uh, one of these forms of abuse, uh, childhood emotional abuse being um, the, the biggest reported stressor in this population. <clears throat> 
Uh, we also know that, you know, in addition to the fact that having early life stresses like um, childhood emotional abuse can predispose one to higher risk of psychosis later in life, um, there's also, I think as most clinicians are aware, uh, a phenomenon whereby a young person typically as a young person is exposed to a stressful environment, like going to boot camp or going to university or simply leaving the parent's house and trying to strike off on independent living. This is a, one of the peak risk periods for developing um, the new onset of schizophrenia symptoms. So acute, acute stressors can precipitate the symptoms, can precipitate the episode of psychosis that then is transformed into a schizophrenia diagnosis. And uh, a substantial people, a substantial portion of individuals with schizophrenia um, have a verifiable acute stressor around that. Um, so as we've been talking about stressful events, then the question comes uh, to what extent does PTSD and schizophrenia co-occur in the same individual? Uh, estimations are kind of across the map with some studies saying it never happens and some studies saying that uh, 50 to 60 percent of people with schizophrenia um, have, will have a comorbid PTSD diagnosis. According to Xiao and colleagues, um, the bulk of the studies converge around an estimate of 20 to 30 percent of people with schizophrenia um, meriting a um, concurrent diagnosis of PTSD. It's also important, as Xiao and colleagues point out, that um, People with schizophrenia, and for that matter, any of the severe mental illnesses, are, are at increased risk of traumatic experiences. Um, they're both neuro, neurobiologically more vulnerable to the adverse effects of stress, but um, the social and environmental consequences of, se of severe illnesses um, not infrequently lead to things like homelessness, uh, like victimization, uh, being the object uh, of, of violence and so forth. And so it's, uh, it's a heightened risk all around. So as clinicians, what can we do to effectively address, uh, address this? And I'm sorry to report that I'm not aware, perhaps if anybody in the audience is aware, I'd be happy to see the, see the analyses, but um, I'm not aware of high quality evidence-based practice guidelines to help clinicians um, know what is the, the best or the quote unquote right way to approach uh, the treatment of someone with comorbid or co-occurring uh, PTSD trauma spectrum diagnosis and schizophrenia. Um, looking at, so although, I, I, although to my reading of literature, we're lacking definitive um, guidelines from professional practice organizations, we can approach the question in a piecemeal fashion, and we can look at what are the good practices or the best practices for PTSD or trauma spectrum diagnoses, and to what extent do they appear um, acceptable or useful in people with schizophrenia. And um, psychotherapeutically, uh, it, no, a number of forms of psychotherapies can be helpful for trauma and PTSD, and similarly, um, a number of forms of psychotherapies can be a highly effective um, in people with schizophrenia. In fact, as an aside, every person with schizophrenia ought to be engaged in an evidence-based uh, psychotherapy. It will improve quality of life and outcomes. Uh, but talking about uh, pharmacology again, in the treatment of PTSD and trauma spectrum disorders, the um, modern antidepressants, the SSRIs and the SNRIs, are viewed as first-line treatment. And uh, antidepressant medications, we actually touched upon this a few weeks ago in the depression lecture, uh, but antidepressant medications, based upon large meta-analyses, um, actually really appear to be um, safe in the when co-prescribed to people with schizophrenia. Uh, not only do they appear to be on average um, safe medications, they also, um, to some people it might be surprising, uh, but these antidepressant medications can reduce positive symptoms, negative symptoms, um, and overall quality of life in addition to depressive symptoms and presumably uh, trauma-related symptoms. So um, I touched upon psychotherapy, and uh, I think I'm going to close with a consideration about um, you know talking or talk therapies or discussions around trauma histories. Um, it's an important issue if you if you listen to people with schizophrenia or um, sort of. Uh, read the discussions in online communities that they form. Uh, trauma history is a big issue and one that affected people on average 
um, appear to think that we neglect as a profession. Um, the, the, the importance of trauma uh, to this population of patients is underscored by a study in which um, a group of people with schizophrenia were asked, uh, if you could rename schizophrenia, uh, what other names would you choose for this cluster of symptoms? And uh, traumatic, traumatic psychosis um, rose to a significant place in the ranking of alternate alternate schemes. So trauma is an issue. Uh, what is the best way to, to, to address it in clinical management is still, again, to my reading of literature, highly debatable. Um, the, the controversy or the debate, and sometimes erupting into controversy, uh, rages between should the clinical approach focus on here and now present moment symptom management or stress management, um, or should the focus of psychotherapeutic clinical activities be on uh, discussing the trauma or events around the trauma or thoughts around the trauma? Should it be more trauma-focused or more broadly symptom-focused? Um, there is not, to my reading, a good answer to that question. And uh, on the other hand, it is uh, not debatable that when practicing psychiatry, for people with for people with schizophrenia spectrum diagnoses, um, clinicians should keep in mind that trauma is a thing. Um, many of our patients are likely to have been exposed to it, so inquiring around it and being sensitive to this possibility um, is certainly something that we can do as we await for um, resolution about these best practice debates. So that is the end of my prepared remarks on this topic.